Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, hopefully, I see a few more people are logging in as we speak. So um, I'm just going to go over some of the logistics. My name is Melissa, and I'm with the National Ocean Science School National Office staff in Washington, D.C. And welcome to our first professional development webinar series for this season. We hold these webinar series specifically for the coaches uh, to help them prepare for our upcoming NOSC competitions, uh, provide some information that they can take back to both their students who are studying for NOSC and just their classrooms in general. And also, um, feel free, you know, if, if you're a coach and you get these, share these um, with other educators. We welcome any educator who is interested in learning about our theme for the year. So for NOSC in 2016, our theme is really about coastal resiliency. Uh, we sort of gave it a fancy name of Science for Strong Coastal Communities um, to ensure that people understood that we were talking about all the science that goes into resilient coastlines. So for our webinar today, um, you'll notice that I have everyone on mute. That's just so that we're not going to interrupt the speaker with phone calls or dog barking or anything in the background. Um, so what I'm going to ask you to do is during the presentation, if you have questions, there's a little chat box you'll see as part of WebEx. We just want you to type in your questions into that box, and I will monitor those. And once the presentation is over, I'll ask those questions to our presenter today. That way, like I said, we keep things nice and quiet for the presentation. So today, uh, we're really happy to have Dr. Joel Spodry, and he is from the University of North Carolina Institute of Marine Science. They are actually our hosts for the 2016 finals competition this year. And he's been nice enough to present today. He's going to talk sort of about how, as you can see, the title of this first slide is how warm, warming, oiling, and fishing are um, altering the coastal ecosystem. So that sort of goes into the biological aspects of coastal resiliency. Just so you know, this is, this is the first of our webinar series. We hope to provide at least two or three more presentations. So make sure to go back to our website, which is just um, you know, www.nosb.org. We'll have a link on the front page to our webinar series page, and you can find all the information you need to access the webinars there. And also just to remind you that we will be recording these. Um, I'm recording right now. And these will go up on our YouTube page, and you can access them at any time then to use during your classroom, during your practice with your teams, or again, to share with anyone as widely as you'd like. So I'm going to let Joel get started and have him present today on his topic. It's all yours, Joel. Thank you. Uh, and hi, everybody. Um, so uh, I think it was mentioned, uh, but if not, I'll mention uh, quickly that uh, we are, uh, UNC is the host for the National Ocean Science Bowl this year, um, later, uh, early in 2016, rather. Um, we'll be looking to, to meet some of you as you come for the, for the finals. Um, North Carolina is a, is a wonderful place to research. Um, it's a fairly dynamic environment where we have both warmer water coming up from the south and cooler water from the north, uh, the Gulf Stream and the Labrador Current uh, colliding. So it's, it's quite a diverse system in terms of environment. Um, we have more seagrass in North Carolina than all the other East Coast states except Florida um, combined. Um, we have more beach visits than all other states except for Florida, uh, California, and Hawaii. And we're the third most sea level rise threatened state um, behind Florida and Louisiana. So uh, the coast is both very important for our economy and for our culture uh, here in North Carolina. And it's also a, a, a system that's just being perturbed by some of the, the normal stressors like climate change, uh, development, um, fishing. And so about three quarters of what I do is, is here in North Carolina, but I also work in other places uh, like the Galapagos and the Baltic Sea, um, formerly on the West Coast. And then as this talks going to be about the Gulf Coast. Uh, but these issues of warming and, and oiling, or at least potential for oil development off our coast, which is being discussed and debated right now, and fishing are, are relevant here uh, and probably where you're at if you're at a coastal um, setting. Um, and so hopefully it's, it's exemplary of the type of questions and issues that 
that, that we address in our lab. Um, and so along the bottom of this first slide, you'll see things like fishing uh, and oiling as we move from left to right. Uh, and then the three uh, middle pictures are all sort of representations of perhaps climate change signatures, uh, like new animals coming into the system or new plants moving north or perhaps increased storminess. And then on the far right, um, this is an invasive, uh, the invasive Asian tiger shrimp. Uh, and it's in the Northern Gulf and also here in North Carolina. And so there's all these impacts uh, that people are essentially having. Um, and then there are people, uh, researchers like myself, who are trying to figure out, are these worrisome? Are these fairly benign? Uh, or are these good, uh, in some cases, uh, changes for a certain ecosystem or for a certain user group? Uh, so what I thought I'd do is I'd really sort of just talk about three different types of, of research lines that we're pursuing. And the first is about regional warming. Uh, the second looks at the effects of the, the 2010 Macondo spill in the northern Gulf. And then the third asks um, how has fishing changed the northern Gulf? In particular, do we still have big fish in the northern Gulf or have we lost uh, the big fish? So I want to move right into talking about uh, the northern Gulf and warming and what that does. Um, and so on the left-hand side, you see a graph that has temperature through time. And those temperatures are the daily minimum temper temperatures in the summer and fall near the mouth of Mobile Bay, which is northern central Gulf of Mexico. Um, and over the last 30 years, temperatures have gotten quite a bit warmer. That's actually about a three degree increase in the daily minimum temperature. And we talk about daily minimum temperature because it's the minimum temperature that may be killing things or keeping things from moving north, not the average temperature. And that three degree shift in temperature is kind of like moving from, Louis, uh, from New Orleans down to Miami in terms of daily minimum temperatures as of today. So that's, that's a pretty big change. And as the temperatures are going up, uh, and as we are increasing CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, uh, we're actually changing a number of things, and they're kind of on the far right, at least in code. Uh, we may be changing primary production. Uh, we may be changing ocean acidification levels. Uh, we may be affecting sea level rise rates. Uh, we, we certainly think we are. Uh, phenology, or the seasonal timing of when things happen, when things bloom, when things reproduce when things spawn. Uh, perhaps increased storminess, uh, a change in the frequency or at least the, the magnitude of hurricanes in particular. And then this last one um, is things may be moving poleward uh, or some things may be moving deeper, but in this case specifically moving poleward to try to um, maintain themselves in a certain temperature environment. So I actually started research in the Northern Gulf in 2006 as a postdoc. And what you see here is a map of, of several sites from Louisiana all the way over to the Florida Panhandle where we were out sampling um, fishes that lived in seagrass. So seagrass is the background. Uh, we pull a small net in the, that center photo and we collect things like you see on the, the right hand side. And in that picture, uh, you certainly see a turtle, uh, but I also see things like birdfish and pigfish and pinfish. And I see a gag at the very top. Um, I see a trunk fish. So we were out sampling um, in 2006 and 2007, and I was fairly new to the Gulf, but I would be catching these fish that when I'd bring them back to the lab to ID them, uh, mm -hmm. the more senior faculty would be telling me, well, that shouldn't be here. That's a more southern species. And that happened often enough where at some point they said, you ought to try to find an older data set uh, and see if the Gulf is, the northern Gulf has always looked this way or if we're seeing more southern fishes, more tropical fishes. And so it so happened that uh, a fellow named Livingston, Skip Livingston at Florida State, had published uh, a similar survey of fishes in the northern Gulf. And in that survey, he had collected about 125,000 individuals. And in the two years that I was sampling, uh, we also collected about 125,000 individuals. And using nearly identical gears, um, nearly identical environments, not always the same sites, but broadly the, the same system. 
So this slide shows essentially uh, the fauna that, that Livingston would have seen throughout the 1970s. And it's a bunch of shiny things. Um, if you know your fishes, and you might not, or at least you know your southeast fishes, these are things like uh, pinfish, the very kind of lower uh, right. And it's just a very common fish, one of the most ubiquitous fishes in, in estuarine um, environments in the, the Gulf and southeast coast. But there's also spot and pigfish and a perch and there's a goby and the, on the lower left there's a file fish and on the upper left there's a pipe fish. But this is a very temperate fauna. Um, and when we sampled in 2006, we saw these same fishes, but we also saw these new arrivals. So we saw things like surgeon fishes and butterfly fishes, several species of snapper. Uh, the one in the middle is called a yellowtail snapper. Um, several species of grouper on the right, like black grouper and red grouper, and even some parrot fishes. In addition to, to those new arrivals, uh, we saw these four species. So on the upper left is a, a lane snapper. This was the seventh most abundant fish that we collected, and it was a fish that, that Skip Livingston would have never seen in 1970. It was completely absent from the Northern Gulf, and now it's the, the seventh most abundant fish. Uh, on the upper right and lower left, you see a gag grouper and gray snapper. Um, Livingston caught those, but we caught them at about two orders of magnitude, so hundreds of times more frequently than what Livingston uh, caught them at. And now uh, gray snapper is, I believe, the, the sixth most abundant species that we tend to see in the Gulf. Um, as of the day. And then on the lower uh, right, that's a parrotfish. And when Livingston saw those, we see them at a rate about 25 times higher uh, than what he did. So again, an order of magnitude. And I'll come back to, to the snappers and the, the parrotfish in a second. And it's not just these fishes. Um, these are other uh, examples of things that are kind of shifting north. Did I lose my... Uh, slides being shown? Actually, I, oh, I think you just might have to find your presentation again. Yeah, I see your computer screen now. Okay, so I need to figure out how, well, maybe I have it here. So it says someone named Benjamin is sharing content. Oh, oops, okay. <laughs> All right. Maybe oh, I'm gonna, I don't maybe know how that maybe happened. Yep, there you are. Sorry about okay. that. Great. No, I'm sorry. Could have been me. Um, so at any rate, it's not just fish, it's, it's other things too. So so this picture shows um, acropora coral that have moved north, both on the eastern and western coast of, of Florida. Uh, there's been increased reports of manatees. While I was uh, living in the Gulf, 2006-2009, there was the first reported catch of a goliath grouper in Mississippi, the first reported catch of bonefish in Mississippi, the first reported catch of red grouper in Mississippi. Um, these are all fairly tropical fishes. And uh, there's increased concern about ciguatera poisoning in the northern Gulf. And this is usually a, a tropical um, toxin uh, that affects fishes and humans in the tropics, and they're starting to see signs of it in the northern Gulf. Uh, the little arrow is pointing from the Chandelier Islands, which is in Louisiana. And the plants you see in the middle picture are marsh plants, but then behind those, those are actually black mangroves. And that's a blow up of a black mangrove seed. So I actually started noticing those in 2006 and asked around. Um, and people were very surprised to, to hear that I was seeing uh, these mangroves there. Um, as of today, those mangroves are actually growing on ship, horn, petty boy islands, which are essentially um, about 30 miles farther north, right at the very top of the of the northern Gulf. These are these are barrier islands that are in the Mississippi and Alabama. And I show these black mangroves uh, here because I want to revisit this this gray snapper that I mentioned. So these are catch rates of, of gray snapper in Louisiana over the last 20 or so years. And what you're seeing is, is recreational fishermen have caught 
um, about two orders of magnitude more gray snapper recently compared to what they caught about 20 years ago. And that two orders of magnitude increase is identical to the increase that, that we've seen in our trawl survey. And gray snapper has another name. It's called mangrove snapper. And so it shouldn't be surprising that at the same time you're seeing mangroves move up the coast, you're seeing things like gray snapper or mangrove snapper move up. So these really are starting to be community level shifts. And again, they're not all bad. Um, if you like catching gray snapper, you're thrilled um, perhaps by, by what's happening. On the other hand, these gray snapper may be having interactions with other fishes or other organisms that we don't yet know or that we're beginning to understand. And it may be seen as, as less desirable. Here in North Carolina, we're seeing a lot more stone crabs. Um, and if you know stone crab falls from a restaurant, they're delicious. And, and people love, a lot of people love to eat stone crabs. Um, and so some people in North Carolina are, are quite thrilled with the proposition of having more stone crabs. Uh, at the same time, stone crabs do things like uh, eat oysters, eat clams, eat other bivalves. And so if you're a fisherman in that industry or you're someone that likes to grow or eat oysters, you may be less thrilled. So with climate change in terms of fisheries, I think we're going to see winners and losers. Um, that's kind of my opinion uh, looking at the different data sets. And just jumping back, uh, you know, the northern gulf is a bounded system, meaning that animals may be trying to move forward as climate shifts, but in the northern gulf, they're going to run out of real estate, right, because they can't move into northern Alabama and Tennessee. Um, so something has to give uh, because they run out of water. And that's shown kind of in this figure. So uh, what I'm plotting on the y-axis is the northern range limit of species that either have been lost in the northern Gulf in the last 30 years, so things that Livingston caught that we didn't, or species that we gained, um, so things that he never caught but we did. And there tends to be this difference in terms of things that have been lost are those species that have um, more northern range limits and things that have been introduced have a more southern range limit. All right, so I want to talk about that, that sort of bounded system in the northern Gulf having a ceiling and everything can't shift north again because it means that you're going to have these different faunas kind of colliding, a more temperate fauna and a more tropical fauna perhaps interacting more, and what does that do? So uh, again, I mentioned before that, that pinfish are, are very, 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 very common. In the Gulf of Mexico, if you catch 100 fish, 60 of them are typically going to be pinfish. They're just super abundant, super, super dominant. However, uh, in our surveys, we were noticing that there are some sites where there's a complete absence of pinfish. So on the lower left, you're seeing a catch from Horn Island in Mississippi. And those fishes in that bucket are all mahara or all the more yellowest fish, with a, except a couple, I see a couple pigfish. But all those yellowest fish um, with red kind of fins or snouts, those are all lane snapper. Um, and in Mobile Bay on the upper right, what you see is essentially a speckled trout, a few speckled trout, the long, skinny, shinier fish and then those gray or mangrove snapper. And in those two places, the pinfish are basically absent, which is kind of weird. And so you can begin to wonder, well, hmm, are these snappers, which look kind of like pinfish, they're the same size, maybe doing similar things, are they out competing or doing bad things for local pinfish populations? So we designed a study, and the next two slides are probably the most complicated two that I'll show, so I'll apologize. But we designed what's called a Bakke study. Bakke stands for before, after control impact. It's a way to look at whether or not some event does have an environmental impact. And in this case, the event is snapper moving into the system. Is that having an effect on pinfish? And so we sampled sites where uh, in the summer, at all the sites, we have just pinfish. Pinfish get there early in the year. They're everywhere. At some of the sites, uh, in the fall, we still only see pinfish. But at other sites, and these would be the impacted sites, we actually see the arrival of snapper. And the question is, does the arrival of those snappers impact pinfish in a way that you don't see at the control site, i.e. the sites that never see that arrival of snappers? 
And so this is actually the, the ugliest figure that I'll show you. Um, but I'll just, I'll just give you sort of the verbal version since I'm not there in person anyway. On the top graph, we were really looking to see if those snapper moving in affect the abundance of the pinfish. So there's going to be a seasonal change at all the sites. But is that seasonal change different when you get snapper moving in as compared to sites where you don't? And the answer is no. So those snapper moving in, they really don't affect the abundance of the pinfish. The bottom graph is the daily growth rate of, of the pinfish. And does those snapper moving in affect the growth rate of the pinfish? And the way that we get it at growth rates, and really what I would think might be most useful for you as you go back to your students, is the tool we used. Um, and what we used are otolith bands. So an otolith is a structure inside a fish. Odo means ear, lip means stone. It's an ear stone. And the fish uses it for balance and, in some cases, hearing. But we can take advantage of otoliths because they grow just like a tree. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing an otolith being cut, like you might cut a tree, and then you should be able to see the rings. And in this case, on this otolith, we have daily rings. And the width of those rings, those bands, equates to how fast this fish grows. And so we were able to go back in time on each of these individual fish that we caught and look at their growth rates as a function of were they ever in the same environment as a snapper or not, based upon the site. And uh, there, what we see is we see a very slight negative effect on pinfish growth. So there does perhaps appear to be some cost in terms of pinfish growth when snapper move in, but nothing too terribly monumental um, that suggests that it should cause a collapse in, in pinfish populations. But uh, again, to highlight the otolith, this is something that all bony fishes have, um, and it's just an extremely valuable, widely used tool in fisheries and marine ecology more broadly to understand the life history of, of fishes. Okay, so there are also other community level impacts that we could think about. Um, and one is what happens to the seagrass. Um, and so in the northern Gulf, there's, there's not too many things that eat seagrass. Most of the seagrass just dies and then enters the tridal food web. But we do know of some things that can eat grass, uh, like manatees and like turtles on the right. Uh, and also uh, these parrotfishes. So now we're visiting that emerald parrotfish, which is becoming more abundant. And what you see in the lower left are the stomach contents of just one emerald parrotfish. And that's a, a quarter size dollop of just munched up grass. So if we're having more manatees moving in the northern gulf, if we're having more turtles moving in the northern gulf, if we're having more parrotfishes in the northern gulf, they're going to consume more grass potentially. And that's going to affect the structure of the grass, which could have impacts on the communities because seagrass is this wonderful nursery habitat for lots of little shrimps and crabs. So, you know, some people may like seeing more turtles. Um, lots of people will. Uh, but they're going to have an effect potentially on habitats, uh, on fishes. And so understanding how these things are all going to work out is, is kind of what we do. Um, so these data are just how much seagrass is consumed by things like a parrotfish versus a pinfish versus something called a plainhead filefish. And the point of this slide is that the emerald parrotfish, they just eat a ton more grass than any other fish that we have in the system. Um, and these, these are data that we published uh, just this year. And so what are the implications of that? Well, based upon our calculations of how abundant these parrotfishes are becoming and how much grass they can consume. The take home message is that they may remove about 5 to 25% of the structure of the grass, the standing stock biomass of the grass, due to their consumption of the grass. So if the grass used to be um, one meter tall, if you add pinfish, if you add the uh, parrotfishes like we are, you're going to decrease the height of every single grass blade by 5 to 25 centimeters, okay? Um, and, again, why do we care? Well, this is a very extreme example of, of what herbivory on grass can do. Uh, the cage that you're seeing is a turtle exclusion device in the Bahamas, um, excuse me, in Bermuda. 
uh, and where you keep the turtles out, you get much taller grass. Everywhere else, the turtles mow down the grass. And you can imagine probably that in terms of little fishes, little shrimps, you know, they much prefer that dense, structurally complex grass because they can hide in it. They can still find their own food. Um, they have a harder time doing that when the grass is mowed down at a very low level. Uh, and so in terms of thinking about how fishery productivity is going to be impacted by uh, climate change, it won't just be the temperature effects. It may be the cascading food web effects. Um, that really changed the system. All right, so that was pretty much what I had for kind of the things we do about warming and climate change. I then wanted to, to talk about um, how, how is the oiling affected estuarine fishes? Uh, I'm sure you're all very aware of the Macondo spill uh, almost, well, now over five years ago, uh, time flies. Um, and there were a number of environmental concerns uh, that people expressed after the spill, a primary one was the effect of the oil on fishes. Uh, the Gulf is, of course, a hugely productive, hugely important area for our commercial fisheries. And some people estimated uh, as early as 2010, uh, early 2011, there would be the calculation that by 2020, the oil spill may have cost the Gulf $10 billion in revenue just because of the, the loss of fishing, because of, of, of weaker fish population, uh, closures. Um, uh, anyway, the fish taking a big hit via the oil spill. So we're talking about, you know, probably somewhere in the order of four and a half million barrels of oil uh, that ended up in the Gulf. And we know from previous oil spills, perhaps most famously the Exxon spill, that oil can hurt fish in a number of ways. Um, the oil itself can mechanically damage uh, the feeding or breathing apparatuses of the fish, uh, the gills. Uh, it can also affect their ability to produce that slime. Most fish, you probably realize, are, are slimy, and that slime protects them from viruses or pathogens. Um, and so you see maybe increased rates of ulcers or tumors on fishes uh, that have been impacted by oil. Uh, but the oil also has toxic effects uh, via uh, PAHs, which even at very low concentrations, like one PPB, so one part per billion, can uh, impact fishes in terms of their reproductive health, their feeding ability, um, gene expression. And if, these, if oil ends up in sediments uh, and is stored in sediments, we know from previous spills that these effects could be chronic uh, and last decades in the case of some spills. So I've been part of, uh, you know, one of the hundreds and, and probably thousands of researchers that have been looking at the effects of the oil spill in the Gulf. And it's a wonderfully complicated system uh, shown here in this diagram. So you can imagine the oil may impact fishes directly, kind of at the lower left, but it also affects the fishes indirectly. It may affect their predators, uh, like bigger fishes and birds. It may affect the habitat the fishes need. Um, in the case of the Gulf oil spill, it closed fishing for a whole year almost, shown on the upper right. And fishing has impacts on fish. And so now we've got to try to tease apart the effects of the oil spill from the effects of closing fishing. Um, and this is difficult. And then you can look at those effects either at the individual organism level or at the level of populations of fishes or the level of community of fishes. And that's really what I'm going to try to highlight here is that I want to show you some data from what do you see when you look at the individual responses of fishes versus what about what are the populations doing? Um, because there's something kind of neat and uh, troubling going on there, at least from a detective standpoint, it's troubling. So these are these are data that are not, that are not ours. Uh, these are colleagues. Um, this is a group that looked at the effects of the oil on marsh fishes, and in particular, uh, a fish called Fungulus grandis. Um, this is the Gulf killifish. If you live on the East Coast and you've heard of mummy chog, very similar beast. Um, and they collected uh, these marsh fishes like Fungulus grandis, it's also called Kakaho down in the Gulf, um, at places that were either oiled, which is 
that site called GT that's in Barataria Bay, Louisiana, or sites that never saw oil, which are basically all the other sites in Mississippi and Alabama. So they've got one site um, where they were able to go collect before the spill and then after the spill, and all the other sites they collected before the spill and after the spill. But again, only one of those sites was actually impacted. So again, this is something called a Baki design, a before after control impact study. So you collect the fish with just little traps, and then once, uh, once these researchers had the fish, they looked at things like the gene expression of the fishes. Are the fish expressing genes that suggest that they're trying to um, remove toxic compounds, uh, which can have a cost in terms of how they allocate their energy into growth or reproduction. Um, they also looked at the physiological effects. And so what you're seeing in the lower right are essentially pictures of the gills of um, the golf jellyfish. So the top row is uh, all from the site that saw oil called Grand Terre. The middle row is a site that never saw oil. And the bottom row are some lab fish that never saw any of the, any environment except the lab. And as you move from left to right, you're seeing essentially pre-oil arriving at shore. In the middle, you're seeing during the peak of oil being at the shore. And then on the far right, you're seeing in the fall, kind of after the oil had stopped being so, so visibly obvious. And I hope the, the image comes across on your computer fairly well. But essentially, uh, at the oil site, you start to see this black gunk show up on the gills of the fishes. Uh, after the oil arrives on shore. And you don't see that at the unimpacted site. Um, and so, you know, this is like some sort of uh, smoker might see in their lungs, right? And that's, we think of that not being good. It can, it can cause emphysema or even cancer. And these fishes can have not those same impacts, but impacts of equal magnitude in terms of cost of fitness. Uh, so certainly, you know, these fishes don't look healthy. It's kind of a take home message. And here's just one other example. Uh, this is from uh, an, a more offshore fish called an amberjack. And at the top, you see a larval amberjack. Um, so this fish can get to be 20, 30 pounds, but it starts out as a larvae that's only about a centimeter long or even less when it's an egg. And the fish on the top has, has never seen oil, and it's a healthy-looking individual. Uh, the fish on the bottom was exposed to oil in the lab. And uh, again, it's hard to point out uh, all the changes about being there. Um, I'm not sure if my mouse shows up. My mouse probably doesn't. But the eye is deformed. Um, the heart is deformed. The yolk sac isn't quite as robust. And the fish is developing spinal cord is kind of in a big F as opposed to, to nice and linear. Um, you know, this fish is pretty screwed up looking. And it's just presumed that, uh, that this species, this population, won't be very healthy if all the individuals are swimming around um, with, with poor eyesight and uh, deformed hearts and low yolk resources and a non-functional um, spinal cord. And so this is sort of a, a big table. Uh, it takes into account about the seven or eight or ten studies that have been done on how individual fishes have responded to the oil spill. Um, it includes Macondo oiling, but also oiling in the Gulf that happened years ago before Macondo. It's species like uh, the killifish, uh, with the picture there on the left, but also other fish like little red drum, um, little uh, croaker, uh, little menhaden. Uh, it's a mix of studies done in the lab, but also field collected animals from all over the Gulf. And then there's different responses shown at the top, kind of in the middle of that table. People look at genomic responses, physiological responses, morphological defects. Do you see increased mortality in the lab? And every time someone's looked for something, uh, the answer is they've seen that impact. So it's yes, 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 yes. Always yes. Every time someone has published a study, they have seen the oil have these negative effects on the population, on, on the individual organisms that they studied. So 
if you're seeing all these effects at the individual level, it makes sense that the population should show some change, right? You can imagine some universe where we've got pre-oiling or post-oiling or maybe a non-oiled site versus an oiled site. The basic idea is that we should find fewer animals at the oiled site um, if the oil is having these negative effects. And so if we go out and we sample for the number of these fishes, we should see that. Well, this is a study that we did, uh, actually sort of that same study that I just talked about in terms of looking at climate change. So we started sampling seagrass fishes in 2006. We did it every year, um, essentially up until now. We had a one-year gap. But we sampled 2006, 2007, 2008, 2009, all pre-spill years. Then we sampled dur during the year of the oil spill, 2010. We sampled 2011, 2012. We sampled again in 2014, 2015. So the data you're seeing here are the catch rate of fishes pre-spill in the darker gray and then post-spill in the lighter gray. And the take-home message here is that we don't see any decrease in the numbers of animals in the Gulf after the oil spill. If anything, we actually see more animals. So on average, pre-oil spill, we caught about a 1,000 animals every time we put the net in the water and towed it for two minutes. After the spill, we did the same sort of sampling, but we would catch 2,000 fishes. So here's a list of all the most common types of fishes. This includes things like pinfish at the top, Lagodon, Rhomboides. Uh, there is a, um, Mahara, and there's some uh, cyanids. Uh, Lutejanids are the snappers. Um, there's catfishes. There's a toadfish, Opsana. Uh, there's blennies, there's groupers, there's flounders, lots of different types of fishes. And on the far right, what you see is the trend in the catches. Did the trend go up after the spill, down after the spill, or was there no change? So NC. So of the 20 most common species, eight of them showed no change. They were the same, had the same abundances after the spill as before the spill. The other 12 species actually showed statistically meaningful, uh, ecologically relevant increases. So these, these bloody things were more abundant after the spill. These graphs are, are also kind of messy. Um, each dot on these maps represents uh, a, a full sample, a full pull of that net in all the different fishes you see. Uh, and these plots are sort of multivariate space, so it's kind of messy. All you really need to know is that the farther two dots are, the more distinct the entire community of fishes are within that sample. So we have four regions. The blue is basically Louisiana. Um, the green is basically Mississippi. The orange is basically Alabama. And the red is basically Florida. And the, the take home here is that in 2010, during and after the spill, the community of fishes that we were sampling looked just like the community of fishes we were seeing before the spill. Those black dots fall right on top of, of all the other collections. So at least in seagrass, you really don't detect any change in the population of fishes post-spill. And what about marshes? So I've also been part of a group working in Louisiana marshes. And this is just a map of all the places we visited. Everywhere that you see with a black dot is a site that we've been and sampled fishes. About half of these sites were oil during the oil spill. Oil actually arrived at the marsh and gummed up the marsh. The other half are our control sites, so they're not oil. And in this case, we're looking at things like our fungulus grandis, that gulf killifish, that wonderful lab rat that people have used for those uh, individual organismal studies. But other fungulids and other sort of killifishes or marsh-associated fishes, things like diamond killifishes or sailfin mollies or sheep's head minnows. Um, these may be fishes that you've heard of just kind of in passing. And on the right, you see three different time periods, three different graphs, and you see the catch rate of those fishes at either the control sites or the oil sites. And the take home message here is that we don't see decreases in the catch rates of those fish. 
Uh, if anything, uh, in 2013, that's a couple years after this bill, we see an increase in the catch rate of fungus grandis, the, the Gulf killifish. And so this is a summary uh, from a couple years ago now, something we've already published. I can tell you that these patterns are holding with more papers coming out, more data arriving. These are the different people that have done sort of population level studies, um, looking at the effects of, of the oil spill. And it's different types of fishes, seagrass associated fishes, marsh associated fishes, open bay fishes in different places, Louisiana, Texas, Louis, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, different types of study designs in terms of is it a baki or is it not a baki? Is it just a regression of oil concentration and fish catch rates? And predominantly, these population level studies look at two things, the density response or the assemblage response. So the assemblage means like the community structure, like are the community structure the same way? And throughout all those studies, they basically never see a response. If anything, the only response they see are more fishes. Um, that's something that a few studies have actually reported. Sorry, that's my phone. Yeah. So there seems to be this, this dichotomy in the literature. Um, on the bottom, organisms or individuals routinely show negative impacts. While populations never show any negative impacts. Um, and why might this be? Well, there's a number of different possibilities. Um, this slide has all sorts of suggestions and hypotheses for why there could be this difference. On the left-hand side, you have, you have mechanisms that are related to how hard it is to measure a population level difference. On this side of the column, it's saying there is a change in the population, we just can't see it because over big spatial scales with fishes, which are kind of noisy in terms of population fluctuations, both temporally and spatially, like there are effects of the oil spill, we just can't see it. On the right-hand side, it, it, there, those are mechanisms which suggest that even if individuals are affected, that doesn't mean the population will be affected, all right? And I don't have time to go through all these, but I do want to highlight one, and that is, the effects of fishing. Um, so what you see here are data for uh, speckled trout, also called spotted sea trout, depending on where you're at on the coast. Um, and these are the catch rates of speckled trout in the four years preceding the spill and then the year of the spill. So 2010 is, is the spill had been going on. We're out there sampling in the fall. So we're out there sampling three or four months post spill. And on the y-axis is the catch rate, and it's a log scale, okay? So, uh, you know, this difference between catching one fish versus ten fish isn't that much vertical space on this graph, although obviously that's a huge difference in terms of numbers. Um, so don't let the log scale fool you. But essentially, for speckled trout, we caught an order of magnitude more fish in the year after the spill than in the, year, the years preceding the spill. And we think that's because speckled trout is a highly prized fish, and most years, people like me and maybe you are out there trying to catch speckled trout, um, and these are the mamas and the papas that would, would be reproducing in the summer. And so in 2010, those fishes weren't caught as frequently because they put a ban on fishing, and so you had more mamas and papas reproducing, and so in the fall, we had more little fish, like you see there on my finger and then in my hand, that had actually been created and recruited to the seagrass. Um, and so this would be a way where maybe there was an impact of the oil spill, but again, it's so hard to see because you've got these confounding effects, like in this case, fishing. Yeah, the real experiment of 2010 in the Gulf may not have been having the oil, for fishes, may not have been having the oil spill. It may have been turning off fishing. Okay, so I'm going to skip this slide. This just highlights some of the things that we think are most likely to be going on and some, that, some hypotheses that we kind of discount. So 
So the last thing is fishing. Uh, how is fishing effective to golf? And I do think in some ways this is the most fun part, maybe the most visual part of what I'll show you. Thematically, fishery scientists, fisheries ecologists are worried about a term called fishing down food webs. So the idea is that 50 years ago, everybody was catching big tuna, big grouper, uh, big flounders, and we fished those too hard and as we've done that, we've moved on to new stocks, and those stocks tend to be lower on the trophic pyramid. Uh, and so now, where we were fishing the tuna and um, the swordfish, now we're fishing shrimp and menhaden, uh, more forest fish, because that's kind of what's left. And in addition to that sort of fishing down the food web, there's also the idea that maybe we're removing the biggest individuals within a population. So if you fish with a net, that net has a certain size hole. Well, the big fish get caught in that, but the smaller fish, they can pass through it. And if those smaller fish pass through it more often uh, and reproduce, well, they're going to pass on their gene. And so one way to pass through that net more frequently is to grow slower. Uh, and so we're selecting, perhaps, for slower growth because those fishes that grow most slowly pass through the net the most time and then live to, to reproduce another day. Or if you just evolve to reproduce faster or earlier in your life, you can pass on your genes. So there's an argument that fishing has, has created a scenario where fishes are evolving to grow more slowly and reproduce at a smaller size. On the other hand, there's a literature that suggests, okay, that's fine. There's genetic selection for, for slower growth but environmentally, fishes may be growing faster because you used to have 10 fish competing for a resource. You fished out five of them. Now there's only five fish left. Well, they can all feed better because there's less competition. And that's called compensatory growth. Uh, and so some people say the individual fishes should be getting bigger because um, they're seeing less intraspecific competition or less competition from uh, individuals of the same species. And so this is a process that's happened over 100 years. And one thing that fishery scientists really fight is we often don't have records that go back that far to really look at this issue or how our communities or how our populations change. What we really want is we want some historical record of the way it used to be. Um, and this is a picture here on the upper right from the 30s where you see they caught a lot of tarpon and a fair number of sharks and a lot of jacks. Um, you know, could, could you reproduce this image today uh, in terms of going out and fishing? Like, could, could you bring back the same, the same number or size of the fish? Because if we can make that comparison, then we know something about how the, the, the system may have changed. And so on the lower left, you're seeing some, some data that were extracted from newspapers. Uh, just pictures in newspapers where somebody looked at pictures in newspapers from the 50s and 60s and up until the early 2000s, and they looked at the, the mean size of fishes that were in those pictures, uh, and they saw a decrease in the size of the, of the fish that showed from those pictures. And that's of concern in terms of, yeah, we're losing some of the biggest individuals uh, from the system. So I want to show you data that uh, are really the, the um, we're the benefactors of three different fishing tournaments that happen in the Northern Gulf, one in Alabama, one in Mississippi, and one in Texas. Uh, and these fishing tournaments have been going on, in some cases, for 85 uh, or so years, um, especially the one in Alabama. And so the picture on the right, that's, a, that's an eight-foot ladder and a six-foot fence. Uh, there's actually a very tall man standing behind that fish. That's a 400-pound grouper. Um, and so, you know, I was born in 1976. I was eight years old. I, I might have been able to remember seeing a fish like that, but I don't remember seeing one that size in my adult life. And so the question is, again, can we recover the way it used to look, and does it look different than what we see today? So the basic game we played was to look at um, data from these tournaments available from going way back in time, like take 1929. And there is the size of a winning tarpon. Um, and then jumping forward 20 years, there's another winning tarpon. 
and it's about the same size. Uh, and then in 2006, there's another tarpon, and it's still about the same size. So the sizes of these winning tarpons haven't really changed through time. And that's a comforting thought, right? That's something that says, okay, we still, excuse me, we still have at least a few big fish in this system. Well, it turns out that we didn't really have to rely on um, pictures uh, because we even had uh, another advantage. And that is, is that going back for the entire history of these tournaments, uh, the leaderboards of these tournaments were published in newspapers. So, for instance, in 1962, um, the day after Marilyn Monroe died, uh, they published the, the leaderboard for this Alabama uh, deep sea fishing tournament. And so we have a record of the size of fish that won. So the fishermen did all the work, right? They went out and they caught the fish and they weighed the fish and they even wrote down the weights. And then we're just able to go look in the newspapers and, look, and extract those data and then plot them up um, through time. And there's about 25 different species that they have these records for, like bluefish and pompano and sharks and sheep's heads and tuna. Um, those different species tend to break down into four types of gills based upon their ecology and the way they're managed. They can either be highly migratory species um, like tuna, um, dolphin, reef associated species like snapper and grouper, estuarine fishes like flounder and speckled trout, or coastal pelagic species. And this is a pretty big catch all, but it includes things like sharks and tarpons and bluefish and bonito triple tail, um, and so I'm going to show you the data basically broken down by those four different groups. Now, there are some, oh, I actually just want to show you some images uh, from these tournaments because there is some really neat stuff you see. So this is an image taken in the 1930s, so, you know, it, it's full on depression. These guys look like they're out of a Steinbeck novel, and they've got some of the skinniest arms I've ever seen in my entire life. Uh, and it does look like the depression was, was, was hurting them in the, in the belly, maybe. Um, you know, I don't know this lady, but I kind of got to know her through the newspaper. She showed up regularly. Uh, here she is in a picture from uh, the 70s with what I think is a bull shark. It's a bit hard to tell. Uh, and then uh, here she is again in the very early 80s, and this is certainly a tiger shark um, that they caught, and it was recorded. Uh, I like these pictures because that's a that's a sort uh, um, a sawfish, excuse me, uh, and they're pretty rare. Um, and in fact, it was rare in these records. Uh, and I also like to be reminded that that's the way people used to dress to go fishing. Um, they used to put on the ties and and go out and hit the water in their in their coats and ties at times. And then on the left, that's a that's a big huge stingray, and you can see the top. Uh, near the block on that pulley, uh, you can actually see the, the stinger of that stingray, and it's probably um, at least the, the full length of a, of a new pencil, so, you know, quite the stinger. Uh, and there's this thing. So this was called a devilfish, just a giant manta ray. And when the tournament started back in the 20s and 30s, this was the, this was the biggest deal. Like, this was the thing to go catch. They would actually go out and harpoon them uh, and catch them that way. And uh, things like the, the devilfish only showed up in the tournaments for about the first 20 years, and then they stopped uh, precisely because they had removed all the big ones. Um, and uh, that's actually not something that we show in our, in our data because we had some rules about how many years of data we needed uh, and some other thresholds you had to meet. But here's a classic example. So they started fishing this thing. They were catching big ones. And in just 20 years in the tournament, uh, the big ones were gone. And they've probably never really recovered in the golf for one reason or another. Uh, these are not, I'm getting very near the end, uh, but these are not fishery independent data. There are some biases uh, because you're talking about using fishermen who are getting better boats, bigger gears. Uh, the plot here is just the number of entries through time. There's actually more individuals going to sampling. So your basic premise may not be that fish should be staying the same size through time. They should be getting bigger uh, because we have more individuals that are out there hunting for the big fish. 
All right, well, here are your representative data for the highly migratory species, of which dolphin is one. So on the y-axis, it's average weight, and on the x-axis, it's time. And what you see here is that uh, we don't see the fishes getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Uh, you've got black dots and gray dots and white dots for the three different tournaments in Alabama, Mississippi, and Texas. Um, it seems like things got bigger for a while, and they plateaued. But we're still seeing big fish come in. We've not lost the biggest fish. Uh, for things like red snapper and grouper, uh, and these data are for red snapper, uh, the same basic thing. And these data really surprised me. The health of red snapper is kind of hotly debated um, in the Gulf. And so the size of fish that they're catching today is like twice the size of the winning fish uh, just 40 years ago. And so again, you may be saying, well, that's just better boats and better gear. That's kind of what I thought. But in the case of red snapper, we had a collection of these otoliths. So now we're back to otoliths. So all throughout the history of these tournaments, people have been pulling otoliths out of red snapper. So some of those fish were born in 1950, some were born in 1960, some were born in 1970 and 80 and 2000. And so again, based upon the width of that band, and in this case, the band is a whole year's band. So the otolith on the lower left that you're seeing, you see about 14 or 15 white bands. That means that fish is 14 or 15 years old. And the width of that first band is proportional to how much the fish grew in that first year. And so we can look at all those otoliths collected through time and ask, well, how are fishes growing across years? And so what you're seeing on the y-axis on this plot is the daily growth rate, and on the x-axis is, again, time. And these data are pretty shocking to me, but what the data say are that fish at red snapper are growing about twice as fast today as they did in the 60s. And why might that be? Well, one, it might be that it's getting warmer uh, in the Gulf, and we tend to associate warmer temperatures with higher growth rates. Another thing is that, um, Again, maybe we had 10 snapper and we fished out five of them, so the remaining five snapper can now grow better because they have less competition. And then a third idea is that in the Northern Gulf, there's been a ton of habitat subsidizing through the creation of oil rigs, but also just artificial reefs, um, concrete rubble, ships. They put a lot of structure in the water that tend to benefit red snapper. And maybe it's all these things. Uh, interacting in a way that's, that's really showing a change in how fast the fish are growing, and it's reflected in those long-term catch rates from the rodeo. Estuarine species like speckled trout, which is shown here, are again spotted sea trout, and they're not getting any smaller. And this really surprised me. Things like flounder and speckled trout, I thought would just be getting hammered, and we'd be seeing smaller fishes today than in the past. And that's just not the case. And then we come to that group called the coastal pelagics. Uh, and so these are data from sharks, and these data are already published. So the different rodeos are broken out into blue, green, and red. And for the sharks, it turns out that the animals were getting bigger and bigger and bigger, probably because of better gears and bigger boats. And then in the mid-'80s, the bottom just fell out. And so now the fish, the sharks they're catching are about one quarter the size of what they used to catch in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and so for the sharks, we are seeing a decline. This is a very busy table, but all you really need to know is that the four groups, the highly migratory, reef associated, coastal pelagics, and estuarine, different species are being summarized. And wherever you see a gray box, is where the fishes are getting smaller. And there is a, uh, there's an obvious concentration, and you're seeing data from Alabama, Mississippi, and Texas as you move from left to right. And there's an obvious concentration of those negative stories in the coastal pelagics. Um, and why might that be? Well, it turns out the coastal pelagics are species that can get very, very big to begin with. They grow to a large size on average. They also take a long time to be, become reproductively mature. So if you remove them too early, they never get the chance to reproduce. And that can affect populations, including the, the large individuals in the population. They've also been targeted by fisheries for a very long time. 
And so they've just, they've just been a very desirable set of species that have actually experienced maybe more pressure. Um, and so that's probably why those are the species that are showing the most negative trends. The other groups are showing some resilience, which is good news. I'm going to skip that. I'm going to skip that. Uh, this was actually my last line of talk I gave, and it's a, it's a plant. It's that black mangrove. And that may seem like a pretty odd uh, summary slide for talk about fishes. But I showed, I showed this slide for three reasons. Um, one is to make the point, is to remind me to make the point that I talked about three different types of disturbance, warming, the oil spill, and fishing. Well, two of those disturbances are kind of what we call press disturbances, meaning that they're always there. They're just continually pressing on the system, and that's warming and fishing. They're always there. And in those two cases, we do tend to see an effect in a change in the communities. Uh, in the Northern Gulf, and probably here in North Carolina, too, and lots of places. The oil spill is what we call a pulse disturbance. You know, it was a one-time perturbation. It was a huge perturbation, but it's not consistently happening every year. And in that case, with the fishes, we haven't seen such a big effect. And so it's almost like the, the press disturbances have the, the sort of subtle, low-level background changes or, or forces they can change the system perhaps much more than the dramatic cult to them. Um, that's kind of a, a working hypothesis based on my observations. But these plants showing this, this mangrove reminds me, uh, again, there are temperature effects. So these mangroves are moving north, uh, and that's going to have effect on the salt marsh. Uh, they they outcompete salt marsh. That's going to change the nature of shorelines. They may also be better buffering shorelines against storms. There's a lot of structure in that plant. Uh, so there may be some good and bad effects of climate change. At the same time, mangroves are very, very, very sensitive to oil. Uh, we know that from other oil spills, not so much Macondo, but previous oil spills. And so what did the oil spill do to mangroves? That's a fairly basic question, but it's one that we actually don't have much of an answer to. Like, did the oil spill really knock back mangroves, like, you know, out of Louisiana compared to where they used to be? Or did it not really touch them at the population level? Um, and so, again, you've got temperature, then you've also got the oil spill playing in. And then these mangroves, they are habitat. So crabs use them, little fish use them, shrimp use them. Uh, and so you can study this one plant and be fairly narrow in your focus. You're studying one plant, the black mangrove. And yet, you can be fairly broad and study the effects of climate change, the effects of an oil spill, uh, fish habitat, and fishery dynamics. And in that regard, I think this is a nice example of, of sort of integrated and interdisciplinary marine science, which is something that we're stressing more and more here, uh, and that certainly your students are probably reading about more and more as you know, physical oceanographers talk to biological oceanographers and chemical oceanographers talk to biological oceanographers. Um, and I even worked with geologists. Uh, we actually co advised a student to look at how oyster reefs are evolving through time. So I, I like this slide because, again, it does remind me about interdisciplinary marine sciences. Uh, so with that, I, you know, it's, it's sort of formed to thank your co-authors and your peers um, and your funding sources. And with that, I'll, I'll be quiet. If there are any questions, I'll try to answer them. Okay, well, thank you so much, Joel, for presenting. Um, for everyone who's watching, this is your chance to ask questions of our presenters. So, as I said, you have a little chat box at the bottom of the screen. You can type in some questions. I'll read them. Um, yeah, and this is your chance. I mean, you've got the expert right here, so ask away. We've got about just over, you know, about 20 minutes or so for questions if you guys have some. Hopefully some people are typing them in. I'm sure you guys must have questions. <laughs> I'm sure most of you are already preparing your students for competition, so like I said, here's your here's your chance. Give any questions. Okay, so the first question is why does the presence of oil maybe lead to an increase of population of fish? 
what do you think? Can we go back to the hypothesis that you were discussing? Uh, yes. Is it, you can still hear me? Yes. Um, well, the honest answer is, is that we, we don't actually know, uh, A, uh, if that's the case. Like, it's not necessarily the oil's causing it um, directly. It could be causing it indirectly. So, for instance, um, we know that the oil impacted things like pelicans and other birds. Well, what do pelicans and birds eat? They eat a lot of fish. So the oil may have a, a slightly negative impact on the on the fish population, but if it has if it has enough of a negative impact on the birds, well then you're relieving predation pressure on the fish, and so that may offset the effects of the oil. Um, and then another predator on the fish is is not a bird or a shark, but it's people. And so the, the way that the oil has a positive effect on fish is perhaps because it, it turned off fishing. Um, and without us out there catching everything, there was perhaps a negative impact of the oil on fish, but that's completely offset by the fact that people weren't out there with nets or, 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 or fishing poles like me, uh, you know, catching fish and taking them home to eat for dinner. Now, there are some other uh, pathways where it could be almost more of a direct positive effect. So, uh, but it, it's kind of all screwed up and it's, it's complicated. I won't deny that. The oil near the marsh certainly impacted the edge of the marsh. Uh, as the oil went onto the marsh, that part of the marsh died. Uh, and it subsequently eroded very rapidly into the bays. Well, that's actually a huge input of carbon for, and you know, that's like a one-time shot of carbon right into the food web. And there are some people working on models and trying to understand if whether or not that carbon input can really kickstart a food web in a way that would lead to having more fish. It, you know, it could just lead to more nuisance algal blooms. But, uh, <laughs> excuse me. Um, but those are some ways that, you know, maybe there's, there's a positive effect of the oil. Um, another way to look at it is, you know, a lot of these studies, like I talked about, are looking at small fishes because that's where we think the oil has the most negative impact. They're the most sensitive, right? A little baby fish is more sensitive than a great big mature fish. Um, well, a mom and pop fish are going to produce a million eggs or a hundred thousand eggs or ten million eggs. And really, to maintain a stable population, of that million eggs, you need two successful survivors. You need two. You've got to replace mom and pop, right? So if you had a mom and a pop and they produce two successful offspring, they replace themselves and the population stays the same size through time. So 99.9999999999% of little animals in the ocean, they're going to die from something anyway. Um, they're going to die from some predator or from some temperature that doesn't suit them or from some disease or for some oil. And if the oil just came in and essentially replaced some predator or replaced some temperature, well, those fish were going to die anyway. There was going to be a bottleneck in their life histories at some point that was going to kill off most of them because the system can't support but so many. And so there's there's a lot going on, and and I don't claim to have an answer. There's just that there's a lot of pieces um, that we uh, realize we either have a decent handle on, or we realize we need a much better handle on. Well, I'll note that um, after you started going through your initial answer, the team wrote in, or the um, Ann wrote in, so thank you. We just had a collective oh moment here, so they got that. So. <laughs> um, Another question was asking whether you've seen any sea level rise, or do you have any data on sea level rise showing up in the Gulf of Maine? So how is the Gulf, or Gulf of Mexico, sorry. I'm from New England, I always see. Oh, got it, got it, got it. <laughs> so um, sea level rise in the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, so, um, and, you know, there, there's two types of sea level rise. Uh, there's, there's actual sea level rise, so that's the, the true level of the water. And then there's relative sea level rise. And certainly in the Gulf, they perceive relative sea level rise because they're experiencing subsidence. So 
So not only perhaps do you have the water level creeping up and up and up, but the marshes in Florida are creeping down and down and down. And that's happening for a number of reasons, uh, one of which is the, the broad marsh complex that is Louisiana is no longer getting fed sediment from the Mississippi. Um, the river is channelized and um, walled, and so all that sediment is going out to the basically the end of the bird foot, uh, the part of Louisiana that sticks out where um, uh, the Mississippi River dumps into the Gulf of Mexico. So those marshes are sediment starved. Uh, there's other theories like, you know, they've been extracting oil, uh, and that oil was like a cushion underneath um, the marsh and all the other land. And you create a, you know, uh, a hole in the earth, and so everything above is kind of sinking down. Um, so they certainly, they certainly do see sea level rise more broadly in the Gulf. And in Louisiana marshes, where it's particularly threatening, there's two things going on. There's both, there's both global sea level rise and there's local subsidence. Um, here in North Carolina, we're actually in a period of about 20, we've had a 20 year period where it's been very hard to observe sea level rise. Um, there's a lot that goes on to determine, you know, local patterns of where sea level is at. Uh, for us, one huge thing is the Gulf Stream. So something that you probably talked about to your students is excellent transport. In the northern hemisphere, as water moves, it deflects to the right. Um, and that's how you get upwelling on some coasts, right? The water is deflecting to the right. And if it's moving south along the west coast, it's going to deflect to the right and move offshore. The same thing happens on the east coast, just not as famously or as impressively. But as the Gulf Stream speeds up, um, water is transported offshore faster. And so we perceive a lower sea level. In 2010, for some reason, which is unknown, I think, to science, the Gulf Stream slowed way, way down. And so we had less water moving offshore, and so we saw amazingly high water here for months. From June through November, uh, we had a lot of localized flooding. And so, you know, there is this, there is this signal of sea level rise that's multi-decadal, and then there's a ton of variability. Um, that, that can impact this place or that place. But in the Gulf, uh, they do see it. Uh, in Louisiana, they see two things, um, which makes it even worse. And then here, you know, in North Carolina, just because I know North Carolina, we're actually in this odd period where uh, it's actually been hard to, well, we've just not seen sea level rise for about 20 years because of this factor and that factor that just has just kind of happened at this period of time. Okay, um, somebody else wrote in this. Thank you very much for your interesting talk. A three degree rise in the daily minimum water temperature of the northern Gulf of Mexico over the last 30 years is alarming. Why have we not heard more more about that in the news? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, so those uh, those data really surprised me when I when I saw them. I was like, well, that's wrong. <laughs> and I spent probably the better part of a week, you know, 40 hours calling people and asking about the, the way those temperature records were collected. This is essentially a NOAA buoy. So NOAA has buoys that collect this information in you know, your neck of the woods and my neck of the woods. Um, and I, I just knew there had to be something that had changed in the way they were recording it. You know, they, had, they used to have the recorder in the shade underneath the buoy, and now it's on the side, and so the heat, the sun is heating it up. I just I just really struggle to to believe those data um, because three degrees is a huge number. Like I like I mentioned, it's like moving in terms of air temperature. It's like moving from New Orleans to Miami. Um, I, I think probably part of the key reason is is that word minimum. So it's not it's not the daily average. The daily average in the Northern Gulf has increased by you know somewhere on the order of almost a degree. Um, and so it's not, it's not yet a degree, it's less than a degree. And that just sounds very different than three degrees. Um, but in terms of what kills an organism, you know, it's not, it's not the mean temperature they experience, it's the minimum or the maximum. Uh, and so that's the reason that, that we hot those data for this pole would shift. Um, 
Yeah, it's not the mean temperature that kills a uh, a mangrove. It doesn't get cold enough at any point during the year for two days. Um, and so that that's part of it. And it's, it's it's the same stuff. You know, it's the same sort of debate that happens everywhere. People people get confused by the rate of change and the the the, the place we sit at now. Like, has it ever been warmer in the northern Gulf? Yes, it has. So the 50s were a very warm period in the Gulf, and the 70s were a cooler period. Um, and 300 years ago, there was a very warm period. And there's a town in, in Alabama called Orange Beach because in the 50s, they grew oranges. And then in the 70s, it got cold, and uh, there was enough frost where they couldn't make money growing oranges in Orange Beach, Alabama anymore. Uh, so the name has remained, but there's no orange uh, industry in, in Alabama. So people would say, well, it's been this warm before, and that's that's true. And what they lose sight of, I think, is is the rate of change is, is so big now, taking over the last 150 years, that they really need to be more impressed by the rate of change and not the magnitude of the change. And that's, that's somewhat subtle, maybe. <laughs> um. I think the last question is, is there any evidence of oil issues directly affecting invertebrates beyond the increased predation of the fish that you had talked about? Yeah, so I I would certainly only claim to be talking about fishes here. You know, you could talk about uh, dolphins or turtles, and they experience the oil differently than the fishes do. We know that, um, you know, we know that dolphins died. Um, do we know if that fundamentally changed their population dynamics? I don't think so, but we know that turtle, we know that dolphins died. Um, we know the marsh died at the edge of the marsh. Like, at the edge of the marsh, if it got oil, it's like 100% mortality. At the population level, it's kind of hard to say, does that matter? Because Louisiana is still, it's still all marsh. Um, but if you were right there very locally, you experienced 100% mortality. And then within that marsh, there are lots of insects. There's lots of spiders. Um, they took it pretty hard for about a year. Um, the insects in oil-impacted marshes really did show an effect. But a year later, they were, they were all the way back. They recovered really fast. Um, other people have looked at blue crabs and shrimps. And their numbers have, have remained, so they're invertebrates, right? They're not fish, but their numbers have remained really high. This is the same sort of thing. You're talking about with crabs and, and panega shrimp, the type of shrimp you eat, uh, you know, they experienced such heavy fishing pressure that the oil could have had a big time negative effect, but turning off fishing had a big time positive effect on the population numbers. And so it's just, it's, an, it's very, very hard to tease these things out. Okay, well, if this is your last chance to type in a question, um, but I think, I think we got most of them. So um, a few people did write that they said thank you. It was a great presentation and they found it informative and interesting. So um, from the na national office, we'd also like to thank you for presenting today. Um, just to let everyone know who's still on, we will post the recording of this webinar on our YouTube station and get that up on our website uh, shortly. And then we hope to have at least, like I said, another two presentations. We have one scheduled for December 9th. We're going to have Dr. Carolyn Curran from NOAA, and she's going to discuss living shorelines. And we'll get you that information by website, email, and social media um, closer to December. So thanks again for everyone for participating, and thank you again, Joel, for presenting. Uh, no problem. Thank you for listening. Everyone have a good night. Thank you. Bye.